That'll be fine. Off we go. Domino's Pizza. I don't know why it's Domino's Pizza, but it's going to be Domino's Pizza. Can you have a mushroom, please? Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Excellent. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hello. We have Neil Simkin from UK. Hello. Carl Horton. Hiya. From the boroughs. Yeah. <laughs> How are you both doing? Yeah, it's been good. It's been good. Busy as ever. It's, um, we're after, I think it's far enough away from Christmas to think that we're back into the full swing of it all now, and it uh, definitely feels like that. Too soon for Christmas songs, then, he's telling me. Well, too soon for the next lot, and oh. too far gone for the last lot. But yeah, <laughs> Easter is on the way now, so we're, we're into the... We've gone away from the, the, the toffees and walnuts season, which usually breaks the teeth, and we're mm -hmm. heading into the Easter egg season now, which <laughs> will uh, no doubt generate some work for us all as time goes on. I've been told to eat more walnuts. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't crack them with your teeth, that's in. Yeah. <laughs> I can, I can. It's, it's a pipe trick. I can actually open walnuts with my hands. Hands fine, teeth. Yeah. Teeth. Yeah. No. I can't open them with my teeth. <laughs> Let's no. not go there. No, definitely not. And if you do, and you fracture your tooth and it needs to come out, come and see us for an implant. Yes. Yeah. That's well, a subtle I'm, plug, yeah? I'm too near for the extraction, to be honest. There you are. Absolutely, with the whole, the whole service available. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Walnuts available at reception. Yeah. You've been keeping busy, Neil? Um, yes, it has been. It's um, been a good start to the year. Um, I mean, a big part of what I do is clear aligners, mm -hmm. as you both know, and uh, we're seeing again a, a big surge in that towards the start of the new year. I think the whole new year, mm -hmm. new me, kind of thing. Lots of people look at that as an opportunity to take on treatments like this. Um, and it's still going. Um, obviously public awareness of the liners is always increasing. Um, and I've been doing the liners quite frighteningly for 20 years um, this year. And so it's... Uh, it's been Don't look old enough. <laughs> Started when you were in that case. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it, it's, it's been steadily growing, but it's starting to grow exponentially. The number of providers and dental clinicians Offering aligners is always on the increase, so more and more are, are offering it out there. Um, so, yeah, we're seeing a big surge in it, and again, patients coming in, hearing more about it. Obviously, there's a lot of press recently with the, uh, the collapse of the online mm. um, aligner company, Smile Direct Club. Um, they had a real surge during lockdown when people couldn't get out to a dentist, and now that people can get back out to their dentist, they're going that pathway, and Smile Direct Club uh, sadly left a few people high and dry. Um, but it highlights that it's, it is a dental treatment. This isn't something that can be done online. It needs that support um, of a dentist who, who knows what they're doing along the way. So, uh, yeah, certainly keeping us, us busy in that regard. I might have thought so. What, what are the expectations like with the patients? I mean, like you've said, they see a lot on social media, you know, telly, different things. So is it high before they've even started? It can be challenging because a lot of patients will come in, as you say, off the back of seeing social media, certain TV programmes set on islands and all that kind of thing. <laughs> um, and it, it's, they, they have a, a vision in mind. Um, Bear, Bear Grylls? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one, yeah. He's got a lovely teeth. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the problem is, of course, is what they're seeing on TV, like so many things, isn't real. What they are thinking is that, because the, the people on those shows will not admit that they've had all of their teeth veneered, they will just say they've had them straightened and whitened, and so patients come in to see us with that same expectation. And often the shape of the teeth is the big issue, not the alignment. So it's all about the discussions with the patients, realistic expectation, bringing those astronomical expectations that the patients sometimes have back down into the real world and addressing things. The great thing with dentally led aligner systems like we offer here um, are that you get to have a, a rough idea of what it looks like at the end. So if those, those issues such as the shape of the teeth are going to be an issue, you can pick up on that from the start. So yeah, we've got to manage that. So just dive in and offer the patient aligners when they're going away thinking that this is going to somehow change the shape of their teeth and make them all whiter. Mm. Um, it's quite a challenge and we do have patients who genuinely think that that's what's going to be the outcome rather than straighter teeth. So it's important to have those conversations with the patients to make sure that you're all on the same page before you start. And again, we're seeing um, problems down at the, maybe the less experienced end of the scale um, where pay, some clinicians are rushing into offering these kinds of treatments because they see it on social media, they want to be able to offer it to their patients, but they just haven't got that experience behind them to, to realise that desire to make the patients happy, which is what we all want to do, 
and can sometimes get a little bit out of control. So that patient relationship, that conversation, and in all aspects of private dentistry, we have more time to do that, to establish that relationship with the patients and make sure that what we are offering is actually what they are able to um, accept as what the outcome, rather than just diving in to try and deliver an impossible solution. Mm -hmm. How fast so, does it take, how quick can you get that sort of virtual end result? So, um, if we, well, the, again, in this practice we have the, 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 the bonus of digital dentistry, we use intraoral scanning um, yeah. to show the patients. So in fact, within five minutes of completing the scan, we can give them a rough idea of how things might look. But the actual plan, we are getting back within 24 to 48 hours. And then we can either get the patient back in, or quite often we'll email that out to them so they've got that, that, that um, speed of the journey is maintained. They're coming fully loaded up on passion and desire to get this treatment done. So we want to keep that momentum. So using the intraoral scanner enables us to get that out to them really, really quickly. So they can have a look and see what they're going to, um, how things are going to be, and we can start that dialogue about expectations and reality, and make sure that we manage those quite easily. So yeah, and then if changes are needed to the plan, those are back within 24 hours. So the process is is really quite quick. Yeah, I mean that is that is rapid, isn't it? Yeah, that's uh, a lot faster than my work. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. patients when they, I mean. What we're seeing again is, with, again, with the, the internet and all the availability that's out there, patients are, they're coming to you fully informed. They will sit there and with a, a sort of greenish tinge around them asking all sorts of questions, implying they don't know what they're talking about, but they have researched this to the nth degree and you have to then look to try and give them the answers they want to hear. And if you do that, then you are the guy for the job. And, and off we go and get the treatment done. So they, they are looking for answers and they've, they've been thinking about this often for months if not years. So when we get them in and do that scan and we get everything lined up for them, they want that momentum to keep going. If we were mm. to sort of get them in and say, oh yeah, we'll, we'll have a look at this in a month's time, all of that desire and passion has gone. So you need to keep that momentum just because the patient is, wants to get this seen and done. And sometimes it may well be that they've got to this point and we'll get the scan done, we'll show them all this and we'll actually have to say to you, say to them, this isn't for you. Yeah. So also, as rather than, as well as getting the, the momentum there and getting the treatment set up really quickly to help them carry on their journey, we can also, if appropriate, tell them that this isn't for you. So they're not sat there waiting months and weeks with all that expectation only to then be let down. So I think that speed, that momentum, and that honesty and candor really goes a long, long way. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think humans are geared up to, to, to that fact. I mean, Amazon is a prime example, isn't it, when they introduced the buy it now button? Yeah. So, I mean, that, that just turnover just shot through the roof, didn't it, because you've got that, I want it now, dink. There it is. So yeah. it's a huge problem, I think we are, we're all sold on that sort of stuff. You can have this and you can have it when you want it, once you made that decision as well. I think the same with us with implants. Once they've made the decision to have the implants, the if we've got to take teeth out and they've got to wait, they get frustrated. Um, you know, there's a very, very strong push, which I don't think is a good push sometimes to do the immediate mm -hmm. kind of work. And we have to kind of, like you've mentioned, rein the expectations back in again and say, well, it's possible, but, you know, we can get a better result if we do this, which is, essentially what you're saying with what you're doing in some respects. So yeah, expectation. absolutely. Yeah. It, it is all about managing that expectation yeah. Yeah. and as well as keeping that momentum and giving the patient what they want, but maintaining that clinical responsibility that we have to do yeah. the right thing at the end of the day, not dive in there just because the patient wants it. Deep down knowing it's not necessarily the right thing to do because we see that happen too often with some of our colleagues who do get drawn into doing something that they know isn't what they would ideally like to do, but it satisfies that patient desire, mm -hmm. and it very, very rarely pays off. You and I are both old enough to uh, remember True. those days of hero dontics, where yeah. we would uh, try and be the heroes where we want, but yeah. we've learnt those lessons and here we are. Yeah. <laughs> well, we used to get paid for it in those days as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. so, a little dig at the NHS. So what would be, so if a patient, they've received that, uh, the paperwork with the scans, yet they still want to go ahead, so what what are the timelines then from then for that patient's journey what would be the next steps for them as soon as the patient has um told us they're happy to go ahead um, with the line of treatment 
we um, arrange a, however they're going to pay for it. So there's the pain, that's the painful part of the process. Um, and once they have paid their deposit, we can order in the aligners, which usually arrive into practice within 10 days. And then because of the systems we have in place for the practice, we can get them in the next day to get those fitted and, and keep that momentum going. So potentially, when everything really falls together beautifully, we've had a patient who came in for a scan and measurements and an assessment and their teeth were appropriate, so we did the scan, sent off for the set of that day, yeah. and because it was early morning, and, um, and we had the plan back that afternoon, it was one of those days where it all just fell together beautifully, emailed that out to the patient who accepted the plan and made the payments the following morning, and then the aligners arrived into practice just over seven days later. So when it all falls beautifully together, they were in on the Monday of week one, and we fitted the aligners on the Friday of week two. That's very So that really kept the momentum. Mm. That doesn't always happen. <laughs> so in, in reality, I would say from the patient coming in for their very first assessment and the scan and the photos to getting the setup, and reviewing the setup, making sure everybody's happy, paying the money, getting the aligners into practice and fit is somewhere around about three weeks, which is still it's pretty good. three, yeah. maybe to four weeks yeah. in the worst case scenario, which is still pretty quick in the, in the grand scheme of yeah. things. Oh, absolutely. And what about sort of age in it? So what would be classed as an acceptable lower and a higher age limit? Well, with the liners now, traditionally when the liners started out, the liners were for solely really for aesthetic improvement in adults. They're not replacing braces, they're done mainly by general dentists, so not orthodontists. We have a desire to help patients tidy things up a bit. And so we can use aligners for aesthetic improvement. As aligner technology is developed and more and more dentists are doing more and more and more are doing some sort of orthodontic qualification alongside their aligner journey, we are seeing the capability increase. So we can do more challenging treatments, we can incorporate other aspects into the treatments such as elastics and buttons and all sorts of torque movements that we couldn't do before. So the spread of what we can do is increasing. We're also, after years of um, reluctance, I shall say, by some uh, members of the orthodontic community, we're seeing those now embrace aligners mm -hmm. because patients want it. Mm -hmm. So that, that you've got to offer that um, out there to be amenable to all, particularly in their more adult patients. Um, and aligners can achieve that. So we've seen orthodontists get into it. So once we see orthodontists move into aligners, we start seeing younger patients being treated as well. Now you've got the challenge teenagers, I know we've all got our own. Getting the big key with the liners is compliance. Would our teenagers reliably wear them all day every day? Uh, not quite so sure. So therein lies the challenge. That's again that communication front. So we still tend to with the liners focus on a more mature generation. So adults onwards, 21 onwards, basically patients who are paying for it themselves because they've invested, they're going to wear it themselves. So there's a lower age limit, I would say, is sort of early 20s. Uh, we have done a few younger patients, maybe in their late teens, but the upper limit is no limit. So any age patient, I think my oldest patient has been in their 70s uh, and quite happy, just something that had been niggling them for years. Their daughter and their granddaughter had had the treatment done, so they thought, you know what, I want in on this, yeah. and saw how easy it was, and managed to get the smile they wanted for decades. Oh, and it wasn't a huge change, but it meant a lot to them. And that's often the case with dentistry, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. What we see as dentists will think is neither here nor there, but the patient has been ruining their life for yeah. years, and if it's we can fix it, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So age range is um, adults, no limit, children, We've seen it done, um, but we tend to see it done um, in older teenagers, so maybe 15, 16 onwards, once the adult teeth are all in and, and formed, but you've got that compliance yes. um, issue potentially. Do you do any fixed? I do do a fixed system. Again, yeah. it's more of a sort of um, selective treatments option rather than a full orthodontic option. Um, I use the six month smile system, yeah. which I think has been well established over time as a good system to go. But with the increase in what aligners are capable of, I've seen my use of that go down considerably. Mm. And so I, I reserve that for where there just isn't a path of insertion for the aligners. Because the aligners are like a mouth guard, of course, they've got, you've got to be able to get them in and out. And sometimes you have teeth with uh, contravening angles, creating significant undercuts. And you know you get the aligner in, 
but it would be very difficult yeah, yeah. to get it out again. Yeah. So there are times when I do that. But what I've found with a lot of my fixed treatments now is that I will get the teeth upright with the fixed, yeah. and then I'll finish it with the liners. Very nice. Because that, that seems to work. Because so, mm. the patients don't like having the wire on for months and months no, and months, no. especially when it's adults. So if we can maybe do three or four months with a fixed wire, just to remove those undercuts and challenging movements, yeah. we can then move into aligners and get things finished off in that, yeah. that pathway. Also, aligners means that when it comes to the end of treatment, they need to wear the retainer. It's not a new experience for them. So I think what we see in teenagers is they've had fixed braces, which they're used to, that's all fine, and then they move into a whole new idea in the removable retainers, and they just don't like it. They also, it's reliant on compliance again. It's not something they're used to. So it doesn't happen. Whereas in adults, if they're used to wearing the liners, they're used to wearing the retainer, it's not a problem, it's not a big change. Yeah. And sort of pain-wise discomfort, what could an average patient expect? Is it when they first have them in each tray? Um, a bit of both. I mean, the great thing with the liners is that it's not trying to go from the start to the end in one go, like a fixed wire does. The fixed wire is trying to recreate that shape and it's trying to take the teeth from fully crowded to fully straight overnight. Obviously it takes years sometimes, <laughs> but that's what it's trying to do, so it puts a lot of pressure on all the teeth all the time. With aligners, it's a very controlled, gradual movement. We're not moving any tooth more than a quarter of a millimetre in any two-week period, and you can move that yourself overnight by pushing your tooth with your finger. So there's no big movements. To start with, when the teeth are rock solid, the first aligner can feel quite tight and it rests on the gums a little bit, so it digs in. But once the teeth are moving, it settles very quickly. And then each new aligner, you might get a little bit of pressure. But we advise the patients to wear them overnight so that they put it in. It's a bit tight just as they go to bed. But by the morning, that's all settled into place. And most of that rest of that two-week period is just the teeth settling into place. And what we tend to find is that patients start to crave that tension of the new aligner, they're looking forward to the next one because it's when it's a bit tight, they're going, Yes, the teeth, the teeth are moving, Feel things like are it's happening. Doing, yes. Absolutely. So yeah. how often are you sort of stripping in between the teeth? Um say percentage wise. Reshaping we prefer to call it. Sorry. These days. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's your other job, isn't it? Yeah. Stripping is your other income. Yeah, sales is another big thing that we are into these days it seems. Um, so yeah, reshaping the teeth, IPR as it's well known. Um, it varies. I mean, ultimately, it's something that some patients will have read about and they're nervous about. And I even see younger clinicians terrified of IPR and having to remove teeth. It unnerves me a little bit that some dentists are nervous about using a handpiece on teeth, but that's a whole other thing we'll come <laughs> on to another time. Another podcast. But, um, <laughs> but it, it, it depends. I've seen some of my more international colleagues from um, across the pond over in the States where they will get a metal polishing strip, not a coarse one, but a medium grit polishing strip, and they'll go between every contact point to every appointment that they see them. Okay. In the UK, we tend to be a little bit more conservative, so we will be very specific about where we do our IPR, and just as and when required. So my rule of thumb is be as conservative as possible, and then do as little as you can get away with. Um, it's case to case dependent. Some patients where they are we are really reducing the width of the arch, we'll have to open up every single space. Um, other patients you can get away without doing any whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, some, sorry. No, that's right. The reason I asked the question is I was, was going to slightly move on. It's my little segue into uh, this club that's suddenly gone bust. Oh, yeah. And I would, have, I would have wondered how they would have done any IPR at all on the basis that it was all done online. And I was kind of wondering how the percentage of the cases you were doing and I would have thought they would have had that many percentage of cases where this was needed, but how was it provided? I, well, it is an interesting one actually, and as a profession we've always wondered how on earth they, well, frankly, got away with it. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, <laughs> um, because, well, you get what you pay for, and if you're paying practically nothing, then that's yeah. what you get. Um, it was always a challenge for the patients and the services. They started um, opening up scanning centres to remove the need for patients to take their own impressions. Yeah. Now, I've met many a dentist who struggles with decent impressions, so how they were making a line is based on patients taking their own is anyone's guess. Um, some patients were turning up with kits asking dentists to do it for them so they could do it. 
Um, some dentists naively were taking it on and then you've got the challenge then that if you do the impressions or even the IPR on behalf of mm. this third party company, where does your responsibility mm. come into the mix? Yeah. So a lot of the planning was done without IPR um, and I'll be honest in, like I said, 20 years of doing aligners I don't think I've come across a single case where I haven't got away with any IPR whatsoever. Mm. Okay. But of course, if you delve deep into the, the underground of these online providers, you'll find that if the amount of refunds that they were giving was very high, yeah. and the amount of non-disclosure agreements they were having signed was also very high, so that they, you, didn't get, you didn't see the bad press, because there would have been, I suspect, quite a lot. Yeah. So um, I suspect their, their overall success rate was relatively low, or exceptionally low, if I'm being honest. Um, but there we go. That's why they don't exist anymore. And that's why we are seeing an increase in, in patients accepting and realising that actually there's a reason they don't exist anymore. And that if you want work done on your teeth, then you need to actually see a dentist yeah. to get that done. And then you've got that comeback, you've got that support, you've got every element that you need to give you the confidence to go through with the treatment. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's, it's important to do your research and find out. You know, and trust as well, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, cost-wise, I mean, these treatments are expensive. There's no doubt about that. But relatively speaking, it, it's it's an affordable way of getting it done. I mean, the, the sort of ballpark figures that we're seeing for most aligners are anything from sort of round about two thousand pounds to sort of three to four thousand pounds, which is a lot of money to anybody. But the treatment and the lifestyle benefits and changes that come with it are a relatively small price to pay in the grand scheme of things specialist orthodontics and all sorts of bits and pieces like that or what people don't understand is how much the NHS pay for their youngsters to have orthodontics it can be double that in some cases um, so if you find an aligner company that's offering aligners for a few hundred pounds you've got to start asking some questions and like I said you get what you pay for yeah. um, if you're really paying bargain basements then the results I'm afraid will probably match yeah. It's been a long time since I've done any author on the NHS. So, I mean, when we did it, we had the, the index of treatment needs. Yes. And I, is, did that change? Did they... Sorry, well, I'm asking you a question you can't answer, can't I, not really? So probably we're talking about 25, 24, 23 years ago, maybe my last case. It, it has changed. I yeah. mean, when I did... I mean, I'm only, only a couple of years behind you, so thank you for the... <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the faith, but it was... Um, uh, the IOTM, when I started, only had five elements to it, it yeah. was one to five. Yeah. It's now got ten elements to it, and plus a matching aesthetic element as well as the functional element. So there's, there's a whole grade of things to go there. Um, so it, it has increased hugely, but with, with aligners in adults, it, you're, it's, you're doing an offering an aesthetic treatment, so we don't necessarily factor in that IOTM as much for what it is, because patients are happy to go ahead with it. The IOTN, sadly, and maybe my increasingly cynical way of looking at it, is used as a way to not offer orthodontics rather than as a way to, well, to offer pretty it. pretty much that was it, yeah. I mean, you had to fit the prerequisite yeah. to see if it was, in that terms, bad enough yeah. to be able to provide them with orthodontic care. And if they didn't fit that, they didn't get it. And, and that has changed, and it's fluid yeah. as well. We sort of see the dentists who are working um, to offer um, teenage orthodontics um, under the NHS, that the, 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 the criteria they use can fluctuate throughout the year and one year to the next, depending on funding, depending on numbers, wow, okay. depending on all sorts of things. I mean, that's, that's the reality. I mean, you'll never find that written down on a policy, I suspect, but the reality is that's what we're seeing. Just because the money isn't there, the yeah. spaces there aren't there, the orthodontists aren't there, you've, you've got to manage the pot that you can, you've got in a way that is sustainable. Yeah, don't, don't talk to me about when you're from Birmingham. <laughs> it's, all, it's all going, I'm going to drive and drive through, but just be a black hole when I get home tonight. It just won't exist. Yeah. Just suddenly. Just get swallowed up. City's gone bust. It's gone, <laughs> city, city's gone, I've never heard of a city go bust before. It'd be a ghost town. Yeah. They'll all move to Wales. Selling everything off, aren't they? Literally. Yeah, arts and funding, I think, which is a real shame. Well, that's the next one. I know they used to own the, the NEC and, and all those facilities were actually yeah, yeah. under the city council, but they had to sell all those off. Yeah. But to see arts funding and even things like the, the CBSO, the world renowned orchestra, is having 100% of its money cut from yeah, next year. Very, 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 very sad. Yeah. 
Yeah, you've got a spare room. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but if, if things like that, um, there's no money for that. We're, we're seeing it happen across everywhere. There's just less and less money available for more and more expensive things. So mm -hmm. it, it is difficult. But in a, as a dentistry often finds, patients will actually will once the general pot is running dry, they will always find money to spend on themselves. Yeah. People will start to put themselves first more and more. Um, and it, dentistry seems to be um, recession proof over the years. Mm -hmm. um, recessions act in different ways. It's very, even though businesses get terrified of them, it very rarely seems to affect the man on the street in the same kind of way it does big business. Yeah. yeah. Um, and people will always, always find time and money to spend on themselves. Yeah. And we saw that through lockdown. I was going to say that. Lockdown is a massive thing, yeah. <clears throat> People had money and the first thing they wanted to spend it on was, was actually themselves. themselves. Yeah. Yeah, make yourself feel good. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm. Yeah. That's important. What's it for? It's for yeah, <laughs> yeah what we all work for if it's, if it's not that, isn't it? It's like I thought it was. Yeah. But yeah, so that's stuff, what's... Uh, stuff the family, stuff the kids. Yeah. Sorry, kids. <laughs> me time. It's all about me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> But no, so the liners is keeping me busy. Oh, um, is that lamp one? Yeah, it's a uh, <laughs> bit rich on the tyres, but otherwise... Like, <laughs> yeah. Is that the red one or the... Uh... Is that the Monday one? It's my week one, one, yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. So, can we touch upon something non-dental, but it involves a dental team? Okay. I do believe you've dragged a lot of the team along with you. In yes. April for a certain event? Well, um, you get to a certain point in life and you start <laughs> clinging on to your last vestiges of youth. And over, <laughs> over the last few years, I've um, started exploring all sorts of different um, personal challenges. I've uh, taken on the, an Iron Man, as I know you have as well, Carl, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and all the, the self gratification and benefits that I was yeah. agreeing with it. Um, but sometimes you've got to go outside the box, and we're seeing a lot of things pop up and it's called obstacle course races, they're outdoor, outdoor trail runs where there's usually a lot of mud and water and all sorts of things involved. And I've been doing these for about five, five or six years now. And I do it with friends, but I realize you go around these courses and you see great big teams there. And one thing that we've really established at this practice here in Newtown over the last few years is a really solid team. Um, everyone works well together, it's, it feels really good. So I thought we would um, celebrate that by going and getting ourselves freezing cold and wet and muddy <laughs> out in a field in the, in the Midlands in, in a month's time. Yeah. So um, yeah, so we are as a team taking on the, the spring wolf run and very much looking forward to it. But it's, it really um, brings together all aspects of team building. A lot of the obstacles that are in the wolf run are unachievable on your own. You need your team around you to help you support through it. You, you need help pe people lifting you up, pulling you down, helping you out. And I think that epitomises dentistry, to be perfectly honest, the modern world of dentistry. Carl, when you and I started, we were locked in a little room with our nurse. You no, just win no windows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nurse, if you were lucky. Yeah. And, then, uh, and that was it all day. It was a very um, isolated, isolated yeah. lonely profession. Whereas now the stuff that we do is so reliant on the team and the team we have here at Newtown has really grown. It's a well-established team. We've been together for a long time. Um, and yeah, let's put that, what we do on an everyday basis in the dental practice, let's take it outside and get some fresh air and just do something a bit different and, uh, and put all that to good use. It's there. created a lovely buzz in the practice, hasn't it? It has, it really just something has. a bit different, but again, as a team, yeah. I mean, it's not teams will go out and they'll have a few drinks or go out for a meal, and you you tend to find that those little things all end up in little pockets, and the younger ones will go off and do that, the older ones will bail out early, the hardcore ones will be through till the next morning. <laughs> um, but it, it never really ends up being a team event where you sat around a table where you can't have a conversation. Yeah. This it feels like a true team building event. I know it's a bit cliche and all that kind of thing, but. Everything we've worked towards here at Newtown and the team we've got together, let's, let's just use that and really go out and do something a bit different. And like you say, the buzz is created. There's a lot of nervousness about it, there's a lot of excitement about it. Um, but it's, I think it will really bring together what we've got here in, yeah. in a really fun way. I agree. I, do. Yeah. I totally agree. Cheers, look, looking forward to it. Yeah, there's lots of teams. When you see them, you'll see there are lots of groups of people together. There's all sorts of things and it's, I think, yeah, it's something good to look forward to and a bit different. 
Are we all going to wear it's the same colour? It does, by the, well, in the first 20 minutes, it doesn't really matter what colour <laughs> you're wearing. <laughs> But you get a nice t-shirt at the end oh, you know, and a cold good. shower to wash up all the mud. So, very uh, good. We'll all know, we'll all stay together. <laughs> We've got a couple who are very nervous who profess that they haven't run ever in their life. But it's not about that, it's about getting around as a team, mm. keeping each other's back, making sure you're all looked after, no one left behind. Yeah, all that yeah, kind of thing. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Piggybacks and everything like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It does, it does, I don't know whether it's just our age mate, but you do start to look at stuff and start thinking, yeah. So a friend of mine that lives up north, hello Tim, he, uh, okay. he's been doing for the past several years and I never ever thought he would ever run and he's been doing these ultra oh. distances, so the, the goat and the spine and all this sort of stuff and uh, uh, hats off to him, I'm amazed, um, you know, at some of the feats that he's achieved. Um, you know, some, some 100 miles or something like that, I think, some of them. Incredible. And, and, you know, unfortunately he's asked me to join him on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking, yeah, I'll give that a go, I'll give it a go. Perhaps not the day after the war from maybe. No, the maybe not after the war from maybe. We'll get there, yeah. <laughs> and then I, I, I speak to a guy on the track and he's very similar, it's what he likes to do, you know, the ultra stuff. And I, I think that's incredible, it's just a different level. I think that's it, isn't it? It is about that, I mean, it, but it's all about stretching your boundaries again and, yeah. and we again not dental related but you can easily draw parallels and, and if you just stay within your comfort zone and just always doing what you've only ever done life can get very boring very quickly and then yes once you get to a, an older part of your life and you start thinking I need to just explore these while I still can those opportunities do come up you and I were both trained towards an Ironman we know what's involved yeah. in taking on these kinds of challenges it's a seven eight hour event um, so you've got to put yourself through it and, and show prove to yourself that you can do it and again you cannot do that on your own you need the support of your friends and, yeah. and your family in a big way but these big rides and i do tend to do cycling cycling is my thing i'm not a runner at all but um cycling 100 mile bike rides and that kind of thing i enjoy doing them but it's not something you can just turn up and do you've got to work towards it um but yeah anyone who does the running i've done i've done a marathon once and that i've, I've done a lot of things i've done tough mudders wolf runs iron man the hardest thing I've ever done was a marathon. It's just one thing for that long, for that far. It's, it's yeah. It's mentally grueling. It is, isn't it? Really, it really is. I did the, so I about cycling, I did the Mad March Hair last year. And um, the group that we started off with, one of the guys that I'm really good friends with, his brakes didn't work, so they failed. We were really early on, we just got the wrong brakes for his carbon mm -hmm. wheels. Oh, yeah. And um, so I, waited for him and then unfortunately lost him and it was I think mean, he said something else and it was chucking it down all the way round pretty much and of course I'd lost the lead group so it was a very lonely three to four hour bike ride oh, over oh, the hills oh. and everything like that and I, and I stupidly hadn't ordered any food because I just thought ah oh, you know I've done this before this is my old haunt I can yeah. I can do these hills no problem at all and but the good news was some of the marshals had jelly babies oh. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, but coming in at the end, I just remember the feeling of just like oh, I'm dying, but it's slightly downhill. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just this you know, old old man coming in and almost fell off the bike at the end, and then you know there was chips and whatever it was. And I don't think I'd eaten so fast. <laughs> but yeah, that lonely on your own. Whereas with a team, yeah, I've done it. Into, I've done lots of cycling. You know, thank you know, really even blessed with doing the Alps and the Pyrenees with the team. Phenomenal, you know, mm. just absolutely yeah. phenomenal. But on your own, yeah, it can be soul destroying. Can't it, it? it can be because you're just chugging away at those miles, and you sort of keep yeah. your head down. Don't, I'm not looking to look at anything, yeah. and it's you've done four miles. Whereas with a team, you know, just know the conversation. Yeah. The, in the same mental feeling, you'd have rattled up twenty miles yes. with friends and support. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so running my marathon, it was. Um, the virtual London Marathon, so I've got a London Marathon medal, but I've never done the London Marathon. But it, it's um, that was I just picked a stretch of canal and ran 13 miles one way, turned around and came oh, yeah. back. Yeah. And it, I felt I got it done, but you're right. It was a friend knew I was doing it, and they came and joined me for the last five miles. Yeah. And that last five miles went in a heartbeat. Yes. Yeah. Because there was someone there, they knew exactly when to turn up and do yeah. the right thing. So that was really grateful. But again, that support, that those connections you have. 
and and now even though we, we were friends before and we're still friends just that last five miles that we shared has created a bond that oh, yeah. just means so much more um, yeah. it, it really is because they understand and so I think all these team events and these things that you do uh, that uh, the importance of the team around you really does stand out okay. and a good team around you just makes the day so so much easier Absolutely. in every aspect. Makes things flow. It does. Except, Except for when they're grumpy. Usually. Nothing. Well thank you yeah. very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank Shall you I? very much. You're very welcome. Yeah, thank Anytime. You. Cole, thank you. Pleasure.